Yeah, thanks. Uh, it was nice seeing you again, Alexander. Um, welcome, everybody. Let me just share my screen here. Uh, so hi, thank you for uh, attending my talk. Uh, my name is Dekel. I hope you've been enjoying Nodes 2020, 2022 so far and learning a lot of cool things. Sorry, Dekel, um, do you mind clicking hello. on the hide button uh, where it says it's yes, showing you? Sure. Yeah, cool thing. Yeah. Is that okay now? Perfect, thank you. Okay. Uh, so my talk will focus on uh, Bluehound, which is an open source tool I've developed uh, to help organization uh, deal with security issues um, and trying to bring that community sense to the security, uh, security community um, and based off you know, Neo4j and Neo-Dash, which I'll also touch a little bit uh, later on. So about me, uh, my name is Deco Paz. I'm a senior security researcher at Zero Networks. I've been in the IT and security industries for over 15 years now, dealing kind of on both sides of the fence. So um, I've been doing like more fancy things, meaning doing simulation of attacks, penetration testing, developing attack tools, things like that. And also on the defensive side, uh, both on enterprise level, trying to help companies stay safe and working on startup companies um, to create products to help uh, organization protect themselves. Um, just a brief about Zero Networks, uh, we're a company dealing with micro segmentation and bringing network security to version 2.0, uh, doing this in a very like automatic and quick uh, way. Uh, you can read more about us in zeronetworks.com if you're interested. And you can find me on Twitter at Deckel underscore Paz. If you have any questions regarding this talk or anything else, feel free to reach out. So I just wanted to kick us off with this quote uh, by John Lambert from Microsoft. Uh, it says, defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. As long as this is true, attackers win. Now this quote became pretty famous, I think in the security community. Uh, you've seen it pop out a lot. Uh, and I really wanted to share it here for two reasons. Uh, first being, um, this is kind of puts us in the mindset of what it's like to be a security, uh, you know, somebody dealing with security. So if we think classically about security, we have, for example, firewalls, one of the most classic um, software or tools that we have. It really works in list. You have a list of rules that says, if a network connection comes in on port whatever, uh, from IT, whatever, you should block it or allow it. So we just have a bunch of these rules, but it's more than that. We have a list of posts that we need to patch um, every, you know, every month or every whatever. Uh, so it could be 5,000 hosts that we need to patch. It could be uh, we have 10,000 users and we need to make sure all of them has less permissions because we don't want each user to be able to do whatever it does. So that's all very well and nice, but attackers don't really think like that. They don't really care if you you know, uh, took 10,000 hosts and you patched 9,000 of them. Uh, even though it's a really big progress for the attacker, it only needs one of each. So he thinks more in graphs or in vectors. He needs one user that can help him get to one computer. And from that computer, uh, you need to get to another computer that has some issue. And that computer may have one open port that allows it to connect to something else. And now we're not really looking at the list, but we're looking at um, in more of a vector path. We just need one of each really to get to where we need. And I'll show an example soon. Uh, but the second reason this quote is here, uh, and which I, why I really like it because it's basically like saying, tell me to use Neo4j without telling me to use Neo4j. So just a little bit of uh, background of, of what a cyber attack looks like. Uh, there's a very famous uh, methodology called cyber kill chain, uh, which has a lot of steps of what, what steps attackers take in order to take control uh, of networks. But I have a condensed and simplified version here, which is more relevant to this talk. So the first stage is the initial foothold. This is where the attacker does some reconnaissance, try to find maybe email addresses of his targets, IP addresses, things like that. And really his aim here is to take control of one host inside that network. So it could be you know, sending some phishing, it can be you know, getting one of the hosts infected, uh, but it just needs one starting point um, inside the network. Now, once he's in, it gets to the network propagation stage, which is probably the most relevant to this talk. 
Uh, this is where the attacker you know, tries to get towards his target. And he does this by basically two main ways. One of them, we call it lateral movement, which means he needs to move around between different hosts. And the second way is privilege escalation, where he tries to escalate the privilege that, that he has in order to get higher permissions. So for example, if you start you know, on a very simple uh, computer, a very basic laptop, and a very simple user that doesn't have a lot of permission, we need to jump around the network with the permission that we have in order that, to get to places where there might be you know, higher uh, privilege credentials or things like that that we can steal. And then we can slowly build up our, our permissions until we get to a stage where we can move to the final stage, which is action on objective, which basically means doing what we set out to do. So this could be stealing some data, uh, stealing passwords, disrupting some service, basically what we came out to do. And this is usually the end of our project. Now, what does this actually look like? So let's assume we have an attacker that took control of this host in this network. And with the credentials that we have, it, it tries to reach the, the server on the right, but it doesn't really you know, have a ways to get there directly. It doesn't have the permissions. Um, but it does have permissions to move around uh, between a bunch of different hosts. Um, so that's all good and well. Uh, now let's assume we have an IT admin uh, in that network. And that IT admin has permissions to connect to the server on the right, the target server. But it also manages different hosts, you know, uh, maybe supports the users, maybe installs uh, softwares and things like that. Once he does that, uh, he will usually leave behind his credentials in some way. It kind of depends on the operation system. On, there's a bunch of different techniques for us to do this as an attacker. But we can assume that once he logged onto that computer, he leaves some residue behind. It could be clear text password. It can be a hash of his password. Um, or it could be session that we instill in some way. But once he does that, the attacker can actually connect to that host, gain control of those credentials, and then move forward to his target. So it looks something like this. I'll steal the credentials uh, and get to the target. And you can probably already see some graph pattern being created here. So maybe now it's starting to look more familiar uh, to what we are used to seeing in Neo4j. Now, the first uh, people that took notice of this and really brought it to community, uh, to the security community as a company called SpectreOps with their open source tool called Bloodhound. Bloodhound really changed the game for attackers uh, because they came and they wrote a tool to collect all this information uh, from a Windows network and put it all on Neo4j and mapped up the graph that looks kind of similar to what we've seen uh, before. So it would look something like this. And this should really look uh, familiar to you folks out there. So uh, let's say we have user Bob, uh, which is a node. That user has been a relationship or an edge of member of uh, towards a group. That group is help desk. So user Bob is a member of the group help desk, meaning he has the same permission as that group. Now, assuming that group has admin, uh, admin permissions to a server called prod server one, we can already say, Bob has a path to prod server one because he is a member of those, that group. He has those permissions and he can connect to the computer. Now, if we take that a step further, we say prod admin, uh, the next node in line, uh, has a session on that server, meaning we can steal those credentials. And also we can assume that that user has uh, permissions to add itself uh, to a group called domain admins. Now, domain admins in a Windows environment that's the highest uh, permissions you can have. That's kind of have, having the keys to the kingdom. But that's always a lucrative um, target for an attacker. So that's, that's always something we look out for. So we have this graph here. And even though user Bob is not really directly related to domain admins and you know, in any UI that you look up, it should have really simple permissions. Uh, you can see here that basically user Bob has the same permissions, effectively has the same uh, permission as the domain admin, which is really dangerous. Now, in the cybersecurity, we have two opposing uh, teams that we usually like to talk in in colors. We have the red team and the blue team. Red team usually refers to the attackers, usually uh, ethical hackers, doing, people doing penetration testing and things like that, so simulating attacks. But for the sake of this environment, we can also include real-world attackers, uh, either state-sponsored or organized crime or anything like that. And the blue team is the defenders. 
So we have the SOC, we have incident response, we have threat hunters, uh, anything like that. Now, security uh, has always kind of been unbalanced between these different forces. So the red team always had kind of the upper head, uh, upper hand, and this uh, happens because a lot of different reasons. But for the sake of this argument, uh, I want to share something we call the red heaven and blue hell. And you'll see what I mean once I share an, uh, a graph. So back to Bloodhound, and you can already recognize this as being near for j uh, as, as I said, you only need one valid path in order to be successful. So let's assume you're on that user on the left, uh, and you know where you're starting, you know where you want to go, that's the main admins group on the right, again, the highest privileged group. And basically, you run the tool, you, you do a simple shortest path query from where you're starting to where you want to go. Uh, you know, it takes a minute, and then you can see a really easy graph that tells you, go from here to here, from here to here, and you get to a domain admin, you finish your project, uh, job well done. But on the blue side, we have what we call blue hell, because we don't really know where the attacker will start. We don't know where they want to go. So we have a lot of different paths. It could be 10,000 paths, it could be millions of paths in our network, and we don't really know where to start from. How do we... How do we even know what we need to fix if we don't know where, where we need to start and where, where we're trying to go? So what do the, in summary, what do defenders really need? Uh, so first thing is collection, just being able to collect all of the data that they need uh, you know, easily and be able to schedule it and everything like that. Analysis, uh, meaning not everybody is an EFOJ uh, expert. We want to really simplify it for folks that haven't don't have you know the knowledge yet or maybe just starting to get into near 4 j and want to learn you know how to do the queries that they need because you know coming from a classic sql world it might be kind of uh scary to get into it uh, so really want to give a lot of value out of the box uh, customization is also a really big one so uh bloodhound for example you deals mostly with permissions, so user permission, groups, uh, things like that, but we want to take into consideration other things. So for example, uh, network connectivity. Can host A in our path actually communicate uh, to, with co host B uh, on the network side? If they can't really communicate, then that path is not really valid, valid because even though you are on host A and you have the right permissions, you won't be able to connect. Another thing is uh, vulnerabilities. So if we have unpatched software that attackers can take uh, control of, those are really uh, big starting points for us to take into consideration. Uh, so really wanted to have the ability to add more information and more customization uh, for everybody. And the last thing is the community side. Now, the red side has always been uh, more open and willing to share. If you go on Twitter now, uh, just look up a few different things. You'll find a lot of different, uh, you know, exploits being shared, a lot of different tools, open source, blogs, YouTube videos, whatever you, whatever your heart desires. You can learn everything just by, you know, just by using Google. On the blue side, we have a tendency to keep things close to our chest. I think it might be because we're usually dealing more with enterprise that don't really want to share information about you know, their network structure and things like that or what they do to defend because they don't want to give attackers that information. Uh, but we still want to take a step in the right direction. So we start, when we started the project, the first thing uh, uh, we started with is Neodash. Now, if you don't know Neodash, it's a really awesome open source project uh, created by Niels de Jong from Neo4j. Uh, it's a dashboard a visualization tool for Neo4j. Uh, it's a web application. You run it, and out of the box, you already get a visualization. You, you get a really cool Cypher query, query editor, uh, the ability to share dashboards and things like that. So if you have, haven't checked that out before, you should really uh, take a look at it. It's free. It's open source. You can do a lot of really cool things with it. And it really starts to uh, help you taking that Neo4j, that graphical data, and present it in ways that will be more useful maybe to people who are not used to working with graphs. So that, when we saw that, we say, hey, that's really close to, to what we want to do. So we actually started by forking uh, that project and created something we call Bluehound. So it's a fork of Neodash uh, aimed to make the graph data sets more accessible for the blue team. Uh, but it 
has a bunch of other use cases, so it can be used basically for anyone because uh, it has a bunch of different changes that will go over uh, from the classic NeoDash. Our first thing is we compile it as a binary using a package called Electron. So now it's no longer a web app, or it is a web app behind the scene, but no longer need to run Node.js and a bunch of different things. You basically don't need to install anything. It's, uh, uh, it's just um, portable, you know, executable. You double click it and you get the interface. I don't think you need to install really is near for j I don't did that. Second thing is data collection automation. So we added, you know, click of a button that lets you run all of your collection scripts, uh, uploads it in near for j uh, You even have scheduling if you want to run it periodically and you can add your own tools and collection if you want to. Uh, increased coverage, so we added a bunch of different tool, a uh, bunch of different scripts, which I mentioned earlier, one dealing with network connectivity, uh, which now has, um, in our graph, it says, can this host actually communicate with host B, or is, it, uh, is the path only based on permission? And uh, also parsing vulnerability reports in order to understand which hosts have critical issues that attackers could take uh, control of. And uh, we have a bunch of pre-built queries, um, again, in order to give a lot of value to somebody starting out for, with Neo4j or even who doesn't even know what Neo4j is, you can open it, you can see all of the different things, and you can start getting into it um, you know, easily. So I'll quickly jump over uh, to the interface just so I can show you some things, explain what it does and what it looks like. So this is the Bluehound uh, interface. Again, as I said, um, basically uh, a compiled binary. Uh, here it's running on my Mac, but it, it's also available for Windows and Linux. So the first thing is we have to configure a few basic things. Domain control is meaning um, what are the most critical servers. Domain controls are the servers that hold all of the, uh, kind of like the heart of the soul of the Windows domain environment. So they have all of the password hashes of everybody. Uh, they have all of the configurations, everything like that. This is really the starting point, And this is really the goal for any attacker. Uh, the domain ad admin groups is the group uh, that has the domain admin um, privileges. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, the keys to the kingdom, that's always the, the biggest target. And crown jewels is a term we use uh, to talk about additional servers that are really critical for us. So this could be uh, HR servers holding HR information. This could be databases. Uh, it could be anything that you know we want to keep an eye out. So you can take a look here at the logical path, and this should already look familiar. Uh, so we have all of this path here. Uh, this is some queries that we predefined. Uh, so for example, we have path from vulnerable host. We have a short description here just to explain what it does. Uh, let's just show it. So. Uh, here, for example, uh, using that information about uh, unpatched uh, issues or unpatched software, we can see that we have this host here. You can see that it has the is vulnerable to flag and CVEs. CVEs are a way for us to identify um, software, critical software issues that attackers use. And now, pretty simply, it's a you know, shortest path query from each uh, host that have critical uh, issues on them all the way to what we want to get. So with the domain admin groups, the domain controllers, um, a very simple path that, that gives us a lot of critical information. Now you might ask me, okay, well, this is nice, but why, why would I even have unpatched so, uh, computers in my network? I mean, I'm supposed to patch everything all of the time, so I don't even need this path. I'll just patch everything and make sure I'm safe. That's nice and well, but in reality, uh, in bigger companies, you know, to, to dealing with uh, 10,000 hosts, 100,000 hosts, things tend to get a little more tricky, especially if you have critical servers that you can't restart for patches, or maybe you have a QA environment that you don't really care about and you don't bother to patch it ever, but there's some residue, there's some uh, permission left over, or there's some path left over, so uh, that's really uh, the point is that now we can start prioritizing uh, what are the things, what are issues we have to deal with so uh, today and not tomorrow because these hosts are really critical for us to patch today 
and we can't wait for them to, until tomorrow. Uh, or maybe there's a new vulnerability that came out today and we're you know, trying to gather all of our inventory, understand where what do we need to patch and how to get started and we can take us a week to get everything patched. So now we know these are the hosts that we have to patch today. We can't wait longer. And other, other hosts, yes, it's very important to patch them too, but you know we have a starting point. Uh, so that's the point of this query. Uh, we can also click here to see what the query looks like behind the scene. Again, it's pretty simple. So we have shortest path query from a computer, uh, going through filter edges, I'll explain this in a second, uh, to the uh, group that we configured uh, earlier, the uh, domain admin groups, with the is vulnerable flag true. And uh, this bit specifically deals with the network information because these paths don't take into consideration networking, so we just uh, remove the network uh, edges between them. And then we return it, so easy as that. Now, if I just uh, mention the filtered edges, so we have this view over here when we can actually uh, decide that we would don't want to look at some edges. So again, I don't have to go and modify any of my queries, especially if I don't have, um, you know, I, I don't have that skill set yet, or I don't want to go and deal with all the queries, you can just take them out here. This is useful because in some environments, they have some weird configuration or something like that. And then we can have a lot of path with specific edges. And sometimes we just want to clear things up. So it's really easy just to filter it out. Um, yeah, and that's basically this query. So we have, again, a bunch of different things here running. Uh, I, want, I don't have time to go into all of the queries, uh, but you can see, you can download the tool again for yourself and take a look at everything. We have Nequel enabled path. Now, this is the same view as before, but taking into, into consideration the networking uh, side of things. So you can see that all of the paths got really, uh, all of the graphs got much lower um, because now we're looking at are these paths actually valid from a networking standpoint? And assuming we do have some firewalls or anything blocking networking and stopping you know, attackers from moving wherever they want, uh, we should have a much uh, you know, a lower view um, when we're looking at this path. So it'll be easier for us to you know, actually go and fix this issue when we know what are the issues that are actually you know, possible for attacker to uh, exploit. Moving on to the statistics tab, now we're getting to the realm of how do we share this information with other people? Uh, not everybody talks in graphs. Uh, for me personally, I found that graphs are really useful when I want to really dig in, dig deep into things and find the issues and you know what are the clusters or what is the node that is giving me the most problem that I need to fix today. Um, but when I want to share it with other um, other teams or peers and have them you know actually fix those issues that I found, it's usually easier for them to get uh, you know more classical. Uh, views. So it could be charts, it could be tables, things like that. So for example, we have uh, here the users uh, with most path to host. So we know what are the most critical users that we need to fix, for example. Um, we also have these uh, table views. These all came out from NeoDash. Um, but we did add the ability to export data to CSV, which is, again, very useful if you want to share that with other teams. If you're not doing all of the work by yourself and you want to, you know, collaborate with other people. Next, taking even a, a, a higher view, now we have the scores tab, uh, which is kind of like a metric uh, showing us different things. It's really nice for management or if we want to take, um, if we want to continue looking at our progress and see how we're doing. So we can see a different percentages for, for example, how many, what is the percent of hosts that we have in our network that have some critical vulnerability, or what is the percent of users with paths, um, and a bunch of different things here. Uh, this specific gate chart was not a near there, so it's something I added, and then I committed back to the main project. So even if you don't want to run Bluehound, you can just download Neo Dash, and you'll have this uh, there today. Uh, and this is some of our basic uh, basic um, charts that we have here. So again, if you even if you've never used Neo Dash uh, Neo 4 J and you don't know what it is, you can just download it and see some critical information and hopefully understand uh, 
you know, how to fix it. A few different changes from uh, NeoDash that we have. So we have this query running here. Now, uh, NeoDash, whenever you open it, does all of the queries on the fly and uh, gives you the information. Now, some of these queries do take a lot of time to process, and we don't want to you know, uh, process it every time uh, we open we open the tool. So uh, we have this nice view that lets you see the queries themselves, and you can run each, uh, each query by itself or do it in a parallel. Uh, just click on the run all. And all of the all of the uh, the data is being cached. So, for example, when I uh, when I open, close Bluehound and open it again, uh, all of this data will still be cached uh, on my host, and I don't have to run it again. Of course, I can always run it from here or from the query runner uh, if I want to get the latest data, but I don't have to do it every time. Uh, I've already mentioned the filtered edges. Uh, we have the data import tools section. So this is where we actually run our collection tools. Uh, at the default, it's configured to run security tools. But again, you can, of course, add your own uh, tools here. You just decide what kind of tool. If it's a binary, it's a Python script. Uh, you just point it to the uh, tool path. You can give your uh, the arguments if you want to pass to it. Um, and we even have this uh, URL button. So if you've shared your dashboard with somebody else, you can just click on it download the tool, save it locally, and you know, have it being run from here. Again, you can run each tool by itself. Uh, you can run all of the tools together uh, in parallel and serial, so pretty flexible. And even we, uh, we added the scheduling, so you can decide if you want the collection to happen uh, you know, once a week, once a day, once a month, whatever it is. Uh, Bluehound will run behind the scenes, collect everything, put it into new, uh, new F4J. And basically, you know, make everything easier for you. Next, we have the save dashboard. So this is something we got free uh, out of the box with NeoDash, uh, but we want to iterate because it's really powerful. Just the ability to save your dashboard. Uh, this doesn't save like your Neo4j uh, database password or anything like that. Uh, just the queries and all of the things that you set up. So it's a really nice way to share. Uh, I, either for backup or share it with peers or hopefully share it with community. So, you know, in our case, this, this uh, defensive security community can use this to share dashboards that they created, share queries that they created, and then we have one place, uh, you know, for all of the interesting queries that we that we created as a community. You can, of course, uh, load it here and have everything, you know, uh, basically looking like this. So um, closing up, uh, we have a bunch of uh, links here. So first of is, of course, for Bluehound. Uh, it's on our Git at uh, GitHub at uh, Zero Networks. Uh, we also have a bunch of uh, other open source tools that might interest you if you're coming from the security uh, community. We have some scripts to extend uh, Bloodhound, and we have some other uh, tools like the networking uh, data and things like that. Um, we have the, uh, the blog post on our website uh, that explain uh, Blue One in a little bit more detail if you, you know, want to also read about it and you know, understand a few different use cases. Of course, I have to give a shout out to the Bloodhound uh, because this is why we're even here. This is, was the start of everything. Uh, so get sure to check that out. And of course, NeoDash, uh, which uh, Bluehound is forked from, again, uh, Buhan gives you a bunch of different things, but if you don't want any of that, you should still check out NeoDash because it's a really powerful, uh, really easy way to create dashboards and visualize uh, your data, even you know, um, without trying to do it manually yourself. Um, thank you. So that's the summer. That's the end of uh, my presentation. Again, you can find me at decal underscore paz at uh, Twitter. Um, you could also reach out on LinkedIn or, you know, any social media. Cool. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dickel. Cool stuff. Uh, very interesting. And uh, um, yeah, 
cool uh, presentation. Uh, can I ex ex exactly, Andreas? Can I see the the clapping emojis for Decal, please? So uh, virtual applause. Um, we have a bit of time, so um, if you don't mind, Dekel, we can maybe I can uh, read a couple of questions that came in. So if you have a question for Dekel, now is your chance. We have five more minutes uh, as part of this official session, and then we can uh, before we lead over to the the final Q and A with Emil. So if you have a question for Dekel, please uh, type it in the chat right now. First question uh, comes from Stefano. Um, about the is vulnerable flag, is that automatically set or um, is that uh, a manual process? How 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 does it how does it work? Sure. Uh, so I created a script, a Python script that parses uh, vulnerability scanners. So there are a, a bunch of different uh, tools. Some of them uh, commercial. So Qualys and Nessus are the big ones. Uh, but we also have a bunch of free ones like uh, OpenVAS or Nmap. So basically, usually what will happen is you run those um, tools periodically uh, in your network and you get reports. Uh, and I just created a script that parses those reports um, and then automatically loads it into Neo4j. So you can either run it from Bluehound. Again, just check it out on our Git page uh, if you just want that script by itself. Um, and I guess you could probably do, you know, a fully automatic solution where you connect to the API or things like that, but this was just a more POC. So if you already have those reports, it's a pretty automatic process to get that. Um, if not, you know, uh, it's just a few clicks. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for that. Let's go away. Uh, so uh, one one question here uh, from uh, Nadav. Um, so is this like Bloodhound for Enterprise? I guess you, you you showed this a little bit. So can you maybe in a few words say what's the difference between Bluehound and Bloodhound? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the question here refers to uh, Bloodhound for Enterprise. So the Bloodhound team actually uh, created uh, I'm not sure if it's released yet or not, but they created oh, okay. a tool called Bloodhound for Enterprise. It's an enterprise version of Bloodhound. Uh, I haven't personally used it. I did, uh, you know, see their announcements and things like that. So um, I think their tool is more focused uh, on just the uh, running it automatically and giving you specifically the, you know, um, the, uh, the Bloodhound information in a more enterprise easy way. Um, Bluehound, well, first of all, it's open source, so you can just get it. Mm. Um, but we really want to create more of a context around it. So we don't want to deal just with user permission, because I think just, just one side of, the, of the, the story. We also have, again, the networking side of it, uh, and we have the vulnerability side of it. So we're trying to create a more a larger story around that and to you know, really go and uh, find the the, the most critical issues, not only permission based, but you know, in general. Okay. And then one more question from Stefano. <clears throat> um, how can, uh, because in the beginning you showed uh, the, the, the red hell and the blue, uh, the red heaven and the blue hell. So um, the, the, how can Bloodhound be used or, or blue, blue hound, can, can it, how can it be used by attackers? I mean, how, how can they use it to graph the Active Directory's information before the target organization has been compromised? Or is it a tool useful? You yeah. Know, that's, I think, what you showed. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Bloodhound is used in, in attacks. Uh, the thing is uh, that Bloodhound queries a lot of different things, but it does that with very minimal permissions. So you'd be surprised at the amount of information Windows hosts are happy to give you, even if you don't have, you know, high permissions. So that's what they use in order to uh, build the graphs. So attackers do use it. They run just the collector side of it usually, uh, get all of the data that they need, usually take, off, take it out to a server, you know, uh, uh, some server outside of the organization, build the graph, see what, you know, where they need to get to, and then just follow the graph. So it, it's used usually, again, in the middle stage of the attack once we're already inside. All right. Cool. And yeah, I think that gives us uh, one more time, one, one time more for one more question from Michael. Did you add any drill down feature in, uh, in the dash? 
forward? Um, not really sure what, uh, what does Michael mean by drill down feature? Um, we have, again, a bunch of different uh, graphs that you can just uh, investigate by yourself, uh, go inside if you need to figure out why some issue is occurring. And we have the more um, tabular views or things like that to pinpoint you know, a more specific host or, or computers that are related to a bunch of different paths or things like that. Uh, so nodes are probably really problematic um, usually that's a, a good starting point to, to understand what we need to fix, uh, what's our priority. Um, then drilling down usually will be, if I understand the question, you have to start understanding why that host, or why that user has permission, that permission, or why that uh, computer, you know, has that session. Usually the answer will be uh, that... Uh, there's no really good reason. It just happened because some, you know, historic events or things like mm -hmm. that. Um, but it could depend, you know, it's different between enterprise and enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, thank you very much, Dickel. Uh, that brings us around to the end of your session. So again, thank you for presenting. Thank you for the demo and for uh, answering a couple of the questions. Um, I hope to see you soon at uh, another event or um, somewhere else. Thank you, Dickel. Thank you. Thank you for having me.